Put all your beliefs into harmony with science. There can be no opposition, for truth is one. One religion, shorn of its superstitions, traditions, and unintelligent dogmas, shows its conformity with science, and there will be a great unifying, cleansing force in the world, which will sweep before it all wars, disagreements, discords, and struggles, and then will, man and then will mankind be united in the power of the love of God. Abdu'l-Baha. Religion and science are intertwined with each other and cannot be separated. These are the two wings with which humanity must fly. One wing is not enough. Every religion which does not concern itself with science is mere tradition, and that is not essential. Therefore, science, education, and civilization are most important necessities for the full religious life. Uh, before I, I, I begin, I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands uh, that in, in the Baha'i faith, outside of Abdul Baha, the son and appointed interpreter of Baha'u'llah's revelation, and his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, and no Baha'i has the right of authoritative interpretation. Thus, we have no established clergy in the sense of most other religions. So what I'm going to share here today just represents my own story and some of my uh, very flawed understanding of uh, the Baha'i uh, revelation. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, share my uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. There it is. So it's, I call it a journey, uh, a physicist's journey to the Baha'i faith, but uh, this is despite the fact that I was raised uh, in the Baha'i family. Uh, and the reason is, is it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that I myself would have adopted this belief system. And the reason for this is one of the central principles of the Baha'i faith is this concept of the independent investigation of the truth. So parents are forbidden from compelling their children to become Baha'is and have no right to infringe on this important decision uh, of the choice of faith or even no faith. Thus, someone uh, even who is raised in a Baha'i family must ultimately embark on a journey uh, towards this faith. Baha'u'llah put forward uh, this uh, principle in one of his key theological works, uh, the book of certitude in the opening verse and uh, let me advance the next slide here where he says no man shall attain the shores of true understanding except he be detached from all that is in heaven and all that is on earth baha'u'llah's son and appointed interpreter abdul baha went on uh, to explain that this first principle is an independent investigation of truth for blind imitation of the past will stunt the mind. But once every soul inquireth into truth, society will be freed from darkness of continually repeating the past. And in another passage, he goes on and he says, man must endeavor in all things to investigate the fundamental reality. If he does not independently investigate he has failed to utilize the talent God has bestowed upon him. So I, I took this concept rather seriously. Uh, and as difficult and as uh, perhaps impossible as it might seem, I did try to live up to this level of uh, what seems to be this uh, radical objectivity, which Baha'u'llah was calling us to engage in. So I studied other religions, uh, considered the possibility that in fact, there might be no religion or, or God at all, and really tried as much as I can to subject Baha'u'llah's claim to uh, critical analysis as I could, I could muster. However, when I uh, studied these older faiths, I found them actually illuminating exactly what Baha'u'llah was teaching. I, I heard in them this, this same ancient voice which has spoken to humanity throughout the ages. And to my feeling, it was, it was speaking to us to again through Baha'u'llah. Additionally, the dramatic circumstances of the founding of the Baha'i faith uh, seem to echo the drama of the gospels and the early Christian martyrs. 
every key issue facing humanity in this age, really this age that we're living in is the, the likes of which hum, humans have, uh, I think, never witnessed. Baha'u'llah addressed over a century and a half ago from the challenges of the division of racism, sexism, nationalism, to the risk of world-changing environmental damage that the rapid technological growth might unleash to this need for global governance. To me, the evidence and efficacy and really kind of superhuman prescience that uh, of his teaching seemed just overwhelming. Another idea that, that, that looms large, and you kind of heard some quotes uh, just now about it, and I might repeat some of those, uh, is, is this idea that religion uh, must accord with science. So if in fact what a religion teaches doesn't accord with established science, then it is superstition and should be rejected. Abdu'l-Baha explains that religion must reconcile and be in harmony with science and reason. If the religious beliefs of mankind are contrary to science and opposed to reason, then they are none other than superstitions without divine authority. For the Lord God has endowed man with the faculty of reason in order that through its exercise he may arrive at the verities of existence. Reason is the discoverer of the reality of things, and that which conflicts with, it, with its conclusions is a product of human fancy and imagination. So as a result of this teaching, I, growing up, I really never had any sense of conflict between my uh, kind of innate love of science and, and faith. And conflicts which I would observe playing out amongst my peers who were raised in maybe uh, much more traditionally religious families. In my mind, there were no bounds on the subjects which science uh, could not address. Uh, there was comfort uh, in knowing that whatever dissonance might occur would be resolved in favor of rationality instead of dogma. In fact, I, I think that the fact that we don't have a clergy and don't have set up these authorized interpreters, that this actually protects us against, against this proliferation of dogmas that, that we see. As I grew up and, and became a researcher myself, I, I came to realize more and more that this dissonance that exists between faith uh, and reason was having a profound impact on humanity and perhaps maybe even our very viability uh, as a species on this planet. On the one hand, it's what underlies part of the extreme skepticism of the conclusions of science by a huge fraction of our population, even as heeding those conclusions becomes more and more important for humanity collectively. On the other hand, there are growing numbers who have abandoned established religions and completely embraced a wholly materialistic worldview. But this appears to me, uh, this viewpoint risks losing touch with an aspect of our humanity that in my opinion, feels like it defines it. That is, you miss out on this wonderful mystical experience, uh, the experience of divine love and ecstasy. And that, that seems just definitional, what it means to be a human being. On a social level, I also think that this view is not without its profound problems, since it leaves human culture unmoored, and I think is might be in part what's driving the increasing fragmentation of society. What I think, and I think is offered in the Baha'i faith, that humanity requires more than ever now, is a, a fully global culture that's anchored in a narrative that honors the diversity of human cultural and religious experiences, yet it unites and binds them together. To my thinking, the Baha'i faith is perhaps the only world faith which offers just such a compelling global narrative that integrates the diverse cultural experiences of humanity, and yet where the concept of the harmony of science and religion is explicitly spelled out in its sacred scriptures. Thus, perhaps it's in a unique position to help humanity move beyond this dissonance. The Baha'i faith 
goes on and, and really frames the dissonance, uh, frames the seismic transformations and dislocations which humanity is currently in the midst of. For example, if you look at any metric of human activity, from population to economic, scientific, artistic, or literary output over time, it's difficult to miss the inflection point that one observes in the 19th century. Every aspect of human society was upended, from race, class, and gender roles to political structures. Even on a planetary time scale, it's clear that we're living in, an, in, in, in a time that has never really been witnessed. Uh, uh, climate scientists and environmental scientists now recognize that we're entering the next great extinction event, which has been dubbed the Anthropocene extinction. The Anthropocene extinction is being driven by human activity and its acceleration is a direct consequence of again, these technological and industrial capacities unleashed since the 19th century. So we are taught now normally that this, these changes in the world that, that happened since the 19th century are a natural product of industrial and scientific revolution. That there's this confluence of banking, industry, the effective use of the scientific method, that this somehow reached the tipping point and led to this dramatic explosion of, of technology and this change in, in, in the world. But outside of secular thought, uh, today most major religions have struggled and for the most part failed to grapple with these changes. And this presents a grave challenge, since how humanity, uh, our human species, collectively manages these changes will determine the very viability of most of the life on this planet. Thus, the values and institutions of human society, which inform our collective decisions, such as religion, morality, governance, these matter more than ever. And their failure to manage these changes have, uh, can have dire consequences. To me, it seemed if ever divine guidance was needed, the time is now. If you look back to the birth of the transcendental movement in the, in the previous century, you can see that uh, there, there's uh, echoes of this, of this uh, need for guidance. When in uh, 1838, uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson addressed the Harvard Divinity School and said, I look for the hour when that supreme beauty, which ravished the souls of those Eastern men and chiefly those of the Hebrews and through their lips spoke oracles to all time, shall speak in the West. I look for the new teacher that shall follow so far those shining laws that he shall see them come full circle, shall see the world to be the mirror of the soul, shall see the identity of the law of gravitation with purity of heart, and shall show that duty is one thing with science, with beauty and joy. The transcendentalist movement drew on this Judeo-Christian mysticism and even beyond that to Hinduism and Islamic religious traditions. And I think Emerson's observation is rooted in this curious expectation that exists in all of the great religions that foreshadow an important and convulsive event for humanity. For example, you can look at the Sanskrit scriptures. They speak of the end of the Kali Yuga the appearance of the 10th avatar. In Buddhism, which grew out of Hinduism, they also await the coming fifth Buddha. Zoroastrians await the coming of Shah Brahman. Muslims like Jews and Christians await the Messiah and the day of judgment. I think what Emerson was sensitive to, but is not much understood today, is that in the late 18th century and early 19th century, this expectation grew very acute. Uh, and all these uh, different uh, sects erupted all over uh, the Christian and Islamic world. In the Christian world, uh, these were known as the Great Awakenings. And during the so-called Second Great Awakening, many Christians were waiting for a great change in human affairs. And a large number of them were convinced that this would occur around the middle of the, eight, of the 19th century. In 1818, William Miller, a lay Baptist minister from Massachusetts, 
after careful study of the book of Daniel, determined that in about 25 years, that is 1843, all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. He would later become one of the more well-known and famous advocates for this impending return of Christ, attracting many followers who awaited for Christ's return in 1843 and 1844. A similar sort of expectation actually led a group of uh, Protestant Christians called the Templars to uh, move to, to uh, present-day Haifa in 1868, and they established a significant colony at the base of Mount Carmel to await for Christ's return. However, of course, when the followers of these movements uh, did not observe him to physically descend from the heavens, as expected, most abandoned these beliefs. To this day, the non-fulfillment of Miller's prophecy in 1844 is known as the Great Disappointment. However, remnants of the effect of this expectation remain to the present day in the churches and religions like uh, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah Witnesses, and even the Mormon Church. When looking at the history of the 19th century, what I find interesting is that many also in the Muslim world awaited the coming Mahdi and descent of Christ. You had Shiite clerics like Sheikh Ahmad and his successor, Sayyid Kazim, who believed in the eminent fulfillment in the prophecies of the Quran. He saw it as his mission to prepare the world for the coming Al-Qaim or Al-Mahdi and the return of Christ. And then, as if in answer to Emerson's prophetic address and the Millerites' predictions a world away, in 1844, in the Persian city of Shiraz, a relatively unknown merchant named Sayyid Ali Muhammad assumed the title of the Bab, which in English translates to the gate, and claimed to be the promised one. He quickly attracted many of the leading sheikhis to his cause. But his brief his brief but tumultuous ministry had many parallels to the life of Christ, gathering disciples, apparent miracles, though the Bob himself forbade the attribution of miracles to his person, preaching against a corrupt clerical establishment and his execution in 1850. The execution itself was shrouded with miraculous overtones when the first execution squad of 750 soldiers completely missed their mark and after the smoke cleared, the Bob had vanished from sight. The second attempt succeeded, but shortly thereafter, the sun was blackened by a sudden storm. When Arthur de Gobineau first introduced the news of Bob's life and revolutionary teachings to the West, it attracted a diverse range of admirers from people like Edward Greenville Brown, all the way to the likes of people like Leo Tolstoy. The French literary critic of the time, Jules Boyes, remembers the effect of the story uh, of the Bob had on the intellectuals of Europe at the close of the 19th century. He says, all of Europe was stirred to pity and indignation. Among the literateurs of my generation in the Paris of 1890, the martyrdom of the Bob was still as fresh a topic as it had been when the news of his death uh, reached us in 1850. We wrote poems about him. Sarah Bernhardt entreated Catul Mendez for a play on the theme of this historic tragedy. The Bob's teachings and its fulfillment in the revelation of Baha'u'llah spoke directly to this universal and trans-religious messianic expectations of the 19th century. Baha'u'llah himself announced uh, quite clearly uh, let me get to there. The time for ordained unto the peoples and kindreds of the earth is now come. The promises of God, as recorded in the Holy Scriptures, have all been fulfilled. Out of Zion hath gone forth the law of God, and Jerusalem and the hills and lands thereof are filled with the glory of his revelation. In the book of Isaiah, it is written, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. No man that meditateth upon this verse can fail to recognize the greatness of this cause or doubt the exalted character of this day, 
the day of God himself. And in another passage, he goes, all glory be to this day, the day in which the fragrances of mercy have been wafted over all created things, a day so blessed that past ages and centuries can never hope to rival it, a day in which the countenance of the ancient of days hath turned towards its holy seat. Thereupon the voices of all created things and beyond them, those of the concourse on high were heard calling aloud, Haste thee, O Carmel, for lo, the light of the countenance of God, the ruler of the kingdom of names and fashioner of the heavens hath been lifted upon thee. Additionally, Baha'u'llah's revelation anticipated the world-shaking and technological impacts which were to be unleashed uh, on humanity, explaining, the world's equilibrium hath been upset through the vibrating influences of this most great, this new world order. And in another passage, all the wondrous achievements ye now witness are a direct consequence of the revelation of this name. In days to come, ye will verily behold things which ye have never heard of before. Thus hath it been decreed in the tablets of God, and none can comprehend it except them whose sight is sharp. In like manner, the moment the word expressing my attribute, the omniscient issue is forth from my mouth, every created thing will, <clears throat> according to its capacity and limitations, be invested with the power to unfold the knowledge of the most marvelous sciences and will be empowered to manifest them in the course of time and at the bidding of him who is the almighty, the all-knowing. And then in a quite, uh, I think, remarkable uh, passage, uh, he goes on to say, now let me find it here. Consider the civilization of the West, how it hath agitated and alarmed the peoples of the world. An infernal engine hath been devised and hath proved so cruel a weapon of destruction that it's like none hath ever witnessed or heard. And he goes on to say, strange and astonishing things exist in the earth, but they are hidden from the minds and understanding of men. These things are capable of changing the whole atmosphere of the earth and their contamination would prove lethal. And yet for the most part, Baha'u'llah's revelation fell on deaf ears. And I think in large part, this is because it didn't accord with the literal and what I would call materialistic understandings of scripture, which most of humanity has embraced. But with each step in the explosive growth in scientific and technological uh, knowledge, serious doubt was created in the nature of the traditional understandings of heaven, hell, angels, and even the origins of humans in the world. Further, major religions appeared incapable of explaining and coming to term with the tremendous changes occurring. And this, of course, seemed particularly strange for those who might subscribe to the view that the divine has guided humanity in the past. Thus, they are faced with an important question. If our scriptures are really divinely inspired, why did they not warn humanity about an event of this magnitude? Logically, if the sacred scriptures from any of these traditions had any valid claim to divine inspiration, they would have at the very least foreseen this event and warned humanity. And even more problematic was that most of the religions may remained wedded to the old political and social institutions that were rapidly crumbling around them. And instead of embracing these changes, uh, they turned backward, struggling to rebuild an imagined glorious past. So you saw the events of the 18th century also coincided with the rise of materialistic philosophies and the precipitous decline of religious belief. So you saw the birth of uh, radical uh, materialist philosophies like Marx and Nietzsche, as well as just a general rejection of God and all forms of religion. So the events of the 19th century have really brought into stark relief this dissonance between science and faith, which has been, but this has been, I think, latent within, uh, uh, within religions and, and, and weighing humanity down for centuries. 
the collective birth of this modern dissonance between rationality and science, I think is traceable to the introduction of what I would term a type of religious materialism that afflicted most of the major world religions not long after their inception. I call it religious materialism since it involves taking, <clears throat> since it involves taking clearly poetic and spiritual or abstract expressions of humanity's relationship with the divine and materializing it and physicalizing it. Thus the abstract and mythological concepts of origins became literalized and set to human timescales. The deity became a physical being. Heaven and hell and resurrection became material places and things. In the Near Eastern and Western society, the rise of this sort of religious material materialism can be directly traceable to the descent of each of the, their civilizations into their respective dark ages. In modern times, it is what has driven the mass exodus of humanity from religion, as the falsities of these dogmas became nearly impossible to ignore, considering scientific advances. However, I think this materialistic view is not a given consequence of rational scientific thought, the, the scientific materialistic view. Although science is based on objective and testable material facts, the materialistic view is not a foregone conclusion and in fact a Platonic or Pythagorean idealism remains a growing and compelling description of nature. The core premise of this uh, sort of thought is that material existence is ultimately founded upon non-physical abstractions or mathematical forms, contrary to the materialistic view. This understanding is rooted in the fact that in science, one only has access to measurable relationship between things and not things in and of themselves. Thus, if something uh, cannot be measured directly or indirectly to some uh, or indirectly relative to something, then by definition, it doesn't exist in our, in our universe. It may exist, but in our universe, we can't say it exists since we can't interact with it. Uh, it's, it's so, for example, when we speak about substances in the physical world, we can only reference their attributes in relationship to other things. In the case of an electron, for example, <clears throat> we don't know what an electron is. We can only establish measurable quantities of charge, mass, and spin relative to some other objects, mass, charge, and spin. Uh, this can, kind of is summed up by the James uh, C. Maxwell, the father of electromagnetic theory, when he explained uh, back in the 19th century, it is only when we contemplate not matter itself, but the form in which it actually exists, that our mind can find something on which to lay hold. Now, to illustrate this idea, you can imagine that if tomorrow all the stuff in our universe were to be replaced with other stuff, yet the exact same mathematical relationships between them were to be maintained, there is no way that we could tell the difference. There is no measurement or experiment possible to distinguish these two universes. In fact, I would maintain that they are the same, and thus what makes our universe what it is, is given by the math. Hence, it is these mathematical relationships that determine what things are and not any reference to a primal elementary substance. In a related vein, Heisenberg, <clears throat> one of the co-inventors of quantum mechanics, argued from the outset that fundamental particles as described by the new quantum mechanics should properly be identified with Plato's forms and was not a true material reality. He described elementary particles as comparable to the regular bodies of Plato's Timaeus. <clears throat> they are the original models, the ideas of matter. So there are many lines of evidence and we can go down this, uh, uh, which uh, I think is beyond the scope of my talk today. But I think it should make clear that this uh, materialistic view that has become ascended is not a foregone conclusion and doesn't, you don't have to go down that route to make it be consistent with modern science. Likewise, on the religious side, if you consider these older religions, there are many lines of evidence that suggest that this literal materialistic view of scripture is also not a foregone conclusion. Uh, so for example, if you look at Christianity, 
any meaningful read of the letters of the apostles, or even how these terms were employed in the Gospels, makes it abundantly clear that the heaven which Christ spoke of was not some physical heaven above one's heads. The bodies which are resurrected were not material bodies of flesh and blood, as Paul clearly st states in Corinthians uh, 1.15. But in, in Baha'u'llah's seminal work, actually, the Book of Certitude, he actually delineates and clarifies the metaphorical meaning of these misunderstood terms, such as clouds, heavens, stars, uh, in the sacred Abrahamic scriptures. So finally, I want to end with that uh, quote that was actually read at the beginning, which I think uh, sums up what uh, kind of my view and what I, you know, why I pursue science and what I think, uh, you know, the Baha'i faith brings uh, to this subject. Uh, Abdul Baha, the appointed interpreter of Baha'u'llah's teaching, observed over a century ago, he said, put all your beliefs into harmony with science. There can be no opposition, <clears throat> for truth is one. When religion <clears throat> is shorn of its superstitions, traditions, and unintelligent dogmas, shows its conformity with science, then will there be a great unifying cleansing force which will sweep before it all wars, disagreements, discords, and struggles. And then will mankind be united in the power of the love of God. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really insightful talk. Um, I think we all really enjoyed it. Um, now we have time for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, just put it in the chat and we will address them. First question is, is the law of gravity an example of a platonic ideal? Uh, I guess you could, I, I don't know if I want to go that far, but I think it, I think you could make it, it, I guess what I would say is that the law of gravity and all, not just the law of gravity, but all the laws of, of physics are basically uh, uh, projections of these Platonic ideals, that they're manifest, they're manifestations of these Platonic ideals. That's the way I would uh, frame it. What are your thoughts and insights regarding writings that speak of transmutation of elements based on your research? Well, we know that transmutation of elements is a fact. I mean, this is what we describe as nuclear chemistry. So uh, that actually is a, is a thing. I mean, it was discovered. Uh, uh, it's, you know, nuclear physics kind of deal, deals with that. Uh, in the writings, though, it, it seems like uh, that the ability, the perhaps, I mean, if the reading is that perhaps the ability might, uh, in the future, there might be a way to accomplish this uh, much more easily, but it, it's hard to say, uh, you know, what, what that will happen in the future or what that would look like. How has your research as a physicist changed your religious beliefs? Has it? Uh, yes, I think it definitely has. Uh, it has um, expanded it. Basically, I think when I was, you know, initially raised uh, or, or kind of my worldview as a younger individual and kind of raised in the Baha'i faith, I, I saw, <clears throat> I kind of had this dualistic view of, and I think most of us do, had this dualistic view of nature, that there's a spiritual world and it's living out here, and then there's the material world that we're kind of living in. And I, my feeling now it, it has evolved, and I don't think that there's this dualism anymore. I think that there is really one uh, one world, uh, and uh, there are just grades of our perception of that of that world, and uh, so the the demarcation between what we call a spiritual thing and what we call a physical thing is a little more fuzzy. I, I guess maybe that that that's the way I'd like to like to put it. And and actually, when I went back and you know you look at Abdul Baha's writings, uh, he actually kind of makes uh, some interesting statements, which I think support that. Where he he describes that uh, basically to the to I think I'm paraphrasing here, but basically to the to a vegetable. Uh, first of all, he says there's one. He kind of affirms that as well. But he also says to to uh, an animal to compare to the vegetable is like a spiritual level of existence. Uh, so he's kind of that line between where we draw the line between spiritual and physical. I think is it's not static. That's interesting. Um... 
Could you explain more about what you mean when you say that things can only be known by their relationships with other things? Yeah, so this is a this is really a structuralist type of uh, thesis. Uh, it's interesting because it, it's uh, it's kind of arisen this this same idea uh, independently almost in in philosophy. In the philosophy of structuralism, but also in in, in physics, uh, there's a there's a it's called structural realism. If you want to kind of get more technical term uh, in in the uh, philosophy of science and, and physics, and and. Uh, so the, the, the basic thing is that you, you just can't, you have to do a measurement. If you want to know what something is or even interact with it, there has to be a way to do a measurement. And so, and so there, you have to establish a quantifiable relationship between, between these things. And what the, the, the understanding I think, and we're coming to understand is that that is really what matters. Those, those mathematical relationships are what matters. And you can kind of see this <clears throat> on some level with the, when, when we're moving now with uh, with uh, computer technology and the virtual reality, we're beginning to see that that it's kind of quite easy to substitute uh, uh, matter, to substitute swap out matter and have it perform in the same way. I mean, that's kind of what a simulation is on some level: is that you're you're taking digital physics, the, the phys physics of the switches inside of the computer, and you're using that to as a substitute for the physics of material of other objects that you're they're used to and to great effect so you can produce the same the same experiences uh, and, and there's even more evidence for this if when you start to get to I don't want to go off the deep end but you get looking at things like renormalization group theory where you actually get different materials uh, different substances uh, like uh, uh, fluids, uh, magnetic phenomena, superconducting phenomena, where when they get to certain phases, they are exact, they behave in exactly identical, exactly the same way. They reach these critical transitions. And so you'll see that the phenomenon can emerge, which doesn't have, doesn't have to do anything necessarily uh, with the actual substance that it's made of. It's, it's these mathematical relationships, which determine what things are. So hopefully I wasn't. Uh, go too off the deep end there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next question is, what's your opinion on quantum physics? Uh, well, that's a, that's a deep one. I mean, I, uh, I have my, uh, my pet theory, and I think I kind of hinted at it here, is that uh, I, I, I think the proper understanding of, 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 of uh, uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics uh, is what Heisenberg was, was, uh, was on to, and that it's 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 really should be understand through the lens of uh, the platonic forms. Uh, that that that's my but I can I, I could wax at length about that. And I've written some articles about it, but uh, I don't want to <laughs> drive everyone. <laughs> um, the next question is: Can you speak on the oneness of scientific truth and the relative nature of spiritual truth? Is there a difference? Oneness of scientific truth uh, and the uh, relative nature of spiritual truth. Well, <clears throat> I would almost say that <clears throat> both are relative on some level. Uh, I, I think one of the great things that uh, uh, has come uh, in the teachings of Baha'u'llah is that uh, he taught us, uh, and Shoghi Fendi explains this, that, that that spiritual truth is relative. It's not absolute. It's relative to the day and the time in which we live. There is a certain humility, I think, and also in science, there's, we have the same kind of idea that, that the truth that we have, what we understand about science is really contingent. contingent. It's not absolute. We don't have, and we never will have absolute knowledge of what, you know, the laws of physics and everything. I think that's a chimera. You're not going to get there. But we do is we build models which work, which uh, explain phenomenon, and those models can change. And that's okay. It's okay. And I think the same thing is with religion. We have currently an explanation the prophets give us, uh, which is appropriate for our age, appropriate for our age of development and our capacities. And those are what are necessary and will allow us to function, to build societies, to understand reality, and to pr progress spiritually. That does not mean that those are absolute, that we've you know, reached some absolute truth, and that's an immutable thing. 
Uh, and I think that's the important thing to understand that these are contingent truth and appropriate to where we are. So uh, I guess, uh, yeah, that's maybe, that's, I don't know. Okay. Um, is it correct to say that all material objects are really force fields or energy? Uh, yeah, I think we're just substituting. I think the important idea here to take away, and this is what uh, quantum, uh, that real insight uh, of quantum mechanics uh, tells us, is that when you get down to a thing like an electron, what they discovered is that, or any other you know, material matter object, a, you know, a light or a, or a electron or anything, when you get down to it, the description of its reality involves using mathematics uh, that is not uh, explicitly physical, that exists outside of the uh, physical plane. It's, it's, it's a mathematical object. So for example, when you write down the Schrodinger equations or the solutions to it, uh, you get something called a, a complex number. This is a mathematical object, which is you know square root of negative one, which which is by definition, from physics and material point of view, a non-physical thing. And so this was the kind of the problem that that people faced in physics in the in the middle of the twentieth uh, century was what does this mean? What is this thing? It's it's a non-physical thing, but it's describing uh, describing our reality. And so there's where we've struggled with. And, and that's where really at the end of it, it kind of upends our usual understanding of what, it, what it, things are when we say a material thing occupies a defined location in space and time. Uh, those, all of those concepts get, get upended and, 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 and blown apart. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's what I can, you know, what I would say. So, so these material objects, I want to kind of get, so these material objects are really, I, I, that's why I say it's relational information, is that, is that really what matters is that math, you know, that those relationships, what, however, we, you know, if, you, if you're a person that believes in some kind of uh, global hidden variables like a Bohmian, uh, maybe there's something there. Uh, if you're not, if you're a Copenhagen guy, then you think, oh no, it's just the math, that's, that's all there is. Uh, I'm kind of more on the line of Copenhagen interpretation, uh, if you're an Everettian, you know, believe that there's many worlds, uh, that even gets more complicated. But all of these guys kind of blow apart this concept of what it means for something to be a physical thing. Uh, uh, and that includes forces, energies. So that's why I balked that it doesn't really mean that their force fields are in it. It, it, it all doesn't matter. It's all, this, it's all the same. All of these things are described in this abstract way. Thank you. Um, do you think science will serve humanity better if it is guided by divine scriptures? Depends how it's guided by divine scriptures. <laughs> as long as it's not like it was in the past, we shouldn't be dogmatic and think that. Uh, I think the, the the danger, and even I, to be honest, you can see this in the in the Baha'i faith and in, in the history of the Baha'i faith a little bit, is reading your scripture and think you understand what it means. And then interpreting it, and then saying, "Okay, this is what it means," and and the scientists, and this is what I think it means. It's talking about the physical world, and that's what it means. And and you scientists, you haven't figured it out yet. You don't know yet, you know. And you can see this, for example, in the question uh, of uh, the Baha'i understanding of ether, you know. So Abdul Baha, for example, uh, talks about ether and talked about etheric phenomenon. And so many people came along later on and said, "Oh." Um, Ether is a true thing. For, for some criticize Baha'is because, you know, famously, you know, Einstein did away with ether, said, oh, well, there's no such thing as ether. It's there's absolute space. And uh, then you had then you had some Baha'is though come along and go, no, no, ether is a real thing. It really exists. Uh, it's a, you know, that those scientists are wrong. They didn't understand anything, you know. And that's not the route we want to go. Uh, what the real resolution is, and what was real, if you understand it really, is it's just semantic, that's a semantic problem. Uh, Ether has just been replaced by this term we call the quantum field. Uh, it's just a rebranding. Re uh, and the way it was used is exactly what Abdul Baha, I think, was, was talking about. Uh, this is it's a word he has to use. He had to use that word. That's what was common. And so he used that word. Uh, 
but I, I think that that's the ultimate resolution because the properties that he describes are, are really similar. Uh, and the differences between ether and the quantum field really amount to this question of its physicality it actually goes back to what I was talking about before. You know, the problem that they had, Einstein had with the ether understanding because ether implied a certain physicality about it, that there was this stuff that was in space that was moving. And now we know that's not true. There is a stuff, but it's not a physical stuff. It's this abstract thing that, that exists. So, so to say, yes, uh, we should be guided by it, but we shouldn't turn into make it dogmatic and have some humility about our understanding of it. Can you share some promising prospects that physical science is leading us, the people of the world, towards today? Uh, I think there's tons of things that are that are exciting. Uh, <laughs> that are happening um there's uh the uh the work that i mean i'm i'm biased to the work that i'm doing <laughs> you know with the uh helping out uh this building this uh, new electron ion collider that's going to be built uh, uh where we're really going to start to understand the origin of <coughs> of, of mass uh and spin in, inside the nucleus uh, to to really understand how these things emerge uh in the in, in the uh, in, as, as emergent properties, because, uh, and, and that, well, I think once we really start to understand that, uh, then we can really uh, answer some questions related, to, you know, back to the origins of the universe and, and a lot of other things. So I, th there's a lot of exciting work that's, that's going on today, I guess I can say. I there's too much for me to like <laughs> compress in a, in a few, few, few paragraphs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does the multiverse exist? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 what do you mean by that? You know, I, I think it's like this. Uh, okay. To be honest, I think, uh, if you, the, according to the tag mark definition of multiverse, then yes. Uh, because, uh, uh, just simply from the fact that, that I think our universe, uh, right, maybe not universe, but like our cosmos, whatever, where we live is infinite. And I just we kind of believe this also in the scripture. Uh, you know, that is eternal and infinite. And once you get into the realm that the, you believe your universe is eternal or infinite, and you and you start to believe in in uh, in, in in the the randomness of quantum mechanics, that the the undetermined non determinism, those two things uh, coupled together kind of lead inevitably to this concept of a multiverse that you're going to have multiple instantiations of of things uh, occurring uh, an infinite number of times. How big is the universe? Can astrophysicists ever uncover that it is endless like we are taught in the writings or can they only speculate that it is really, really big? Yeah, it's like, no, you're not gonna ever know that it's, <laughs> no. I mean, one of the things we can, one of the one of the indications that the universe is infinite, actually we have evidence uh, and that the best evidence we have is that it's flat. Uh, so far as the astrophysicists have been able to measure, it's flat just going out. And so that implies to the best Occam's razor, the best guess is that it's, it continues to be, but that we won't know. Maybe it, it curves at some point. And even if it does curve, doesn't mean that they're not other universe. I mean, it's, I, I think you kind of have to, if you want to, you know, I think in one of the problems in, in the origins in physics is where does order come from, right? You know, where, and you're only going to, I think, the only way you, you solve this problem is either you postulate a deity that kind of comes down and gives you the order. Uh, but the other way uh, is that you say, well, the universe is infinite and somehow there's that, that recurrence in statistics and probability that give you, will give you a rise in order uh, every, every now and then. And, and, and so I think, you, I, I think you can't get around getting, having an infinite universe just from logical considerations, personally. Do you think the passage you read of Baha'u'llah's was a prophecy concerning the discovery of atomic power and or of global warming? I think there are two ways you can read it. I show you Fendi, you know, actually referred back again to this in, in another passage, this thing, and, and clearly indicated that it was that it was kind of a presaging uh, nuclear, the, the effects of atomic power. But I, I, I would read it though as even more broader than that. I think he's just talking generally that, about technology. Uh, and one of, the, one of the aspects of it could be global warming. Uh, that's my reading. 
Have you been able to discuss these topics with your colleagues at BNL and the cafeteria, et cetera? Uh, nah, sometimes. I have some people that are, most people are pretty uh, I'm an atheist, uh, so I, it doesn't really come up too much, uh, you know, religion or these, these type of questions. Uh, but uh, there are some that are kind of more, uh, you know, into Vedanta or some, you know, kind of more uh, spiritually minded and talked a little bit, but not, not too much. Do you believe in randomness that anything is random or can be random? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, uh, yeah, I have my own kind of thoughts that, 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 uh, you know, in, in physics, we have, like we were talking about before the origins of order. I, I think in physics, we have basically two types of physics that we know exist. We have what we call uh, unitary physics or deterministic physics that, that, you know, you, like Newton's laws, you know, you have one action, it leads to another reaction, and it's all predictable. It all unfolds like clockwork. It's the, the clockwork universe model that we, that people used to subscribe to. So if you knew the initial conditions of, of the universe at any point in time, you could evolve it into the future exactly and know exactly what's going to happen, you know, and, and, and so it's completely predictable. And the problem with that, uh, that type of model is there's really no or, there's no mechanism for order to spawn to, to to emerge in that system, especially if it's has a long time to live. So where did the order come from? It, 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 you know, because then the entropy will, you know, second law, it'll die out. But then there's this other side of physics which uh, comes in from quantum mechanics, is that there's there is this uh, randomness, this uh, indeterminist, uh, non-deterministic type of physics that that occurs, and. Uh, to our knowledge and our belief, uh, it appears to be random. Now, you can never prove that it's random. There could be some something going on there. I kind of think, in my private opinion, that if we are looking for the will of God uh, from a theological point of view to, to act in the world, that's probably the place where it's going to live. Uh, where it's going to exist is in is in these random processes. And in, it's interesting because we we actually think that you know, the best ideas of how origins of the universe is some that, you know, we think that prior to the Big Bang, that maybe there was some quantum vacuum fluctuation that, that caused a uh, being to come into existence. Uh, that's uh, one, one idea or the kind of popular one. Uh, so again, it's coming from that random, those random, uh, random processes, uh, uh, which by the way, is another thing that is interesting about those random processes that they are also predicated on the process of measurement or observation. So there's kind of an interesting connection back to the very, I, the very mechanics of what it means to have a mind since mind is predicated on, on observation and, and measurement. Uh, so uh, I, I think that, uh, but to answer his question, it, uh, do you think anything is random or, or can be random? I, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, as a, the, as a, the, as a Baha'i, I think that uh, ultimately it's in the hands of, 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 of God, you know, that, and that's, he's, that's his will <laughs> on some level. So. Um, the next question is, has extraterrestrial life been discovered? Why? Well, I don't know. I don't. I have. If it has been, I haven't uh, been privy to it, other than what you guys see on the <laughs> on the on the TV about the, the UFOs. <laughs> I think it. I think it is it highly likely uh, that it absolutely has to exist. I'm pretty confident, given the mess, how big our universe is, and it's just impossible not to conceive that there aren't uh, other. But whether they come here and they're, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay looks like that is all the questions we have so thank you again so much to dr rangebeck for joining us today and offering all your expertise and perspective and knowledge with us we really we all learned a lot this was a great conversation thank you for having me of course um so next week our speaker will be miss francoise legoff and her topic will be how can one be happy in today's world so again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time. And if you're not already, already on our mailing list, I'll put uh, the link to our contact form in the chat. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next Saturday.